Yeah. So it's just a recent example to draw back to. That's a perfect example. So if you, have, you are a layperson, you're not a good layperson. You don't know much, but you've taken BDBS. Okay. Well, that's a good and you're in this particular traffic jam right here. You know, you begin to look around and go, wow, where's a good place for a woman to have a baby? I personally would pick that little RV over there, you know, because you'd have a place to lay down. And so this is a way to get people to start thinking outside the box and looking at the resources they have and using them, but not in a way that causes harm, okay? I like that too. No phone service, the internet's down, nobody's cell phone's working, and you don't have any gas for your vehicles anyway. Mm -hmm. In West Virginia, a couple years ago, we had this freak storm called a derecho. Wiped out the power grid for two weeks. It was great. You know, like, we should all do that. And everybody had to begin to think about what resources we had to be able to help each other and to be able to feed ourselves and to be able to survive. One of my favorite stories is my mother-in-law. She's an 80-year-old lady, right? And I went out to check on her, and she says to me, you know, I've been looking around, and there's a pile of rocks right out there, and I'm pretty sure I can make a fire pit, a fire circle, and I have an old, um, like, stove rack, and I think I can put that over there, and I'll be able to provide food. I was like, well, honey, we got, you know, like, several years worth of propane out there. I think we'll be okay. But I was so impressed by this elder woman who didn't stop and lament that she didn't have what she normally used, but began to look around and see what she had because she understood the basic necessity of survival. And so that's what you're going to do in these situations. You're going to look around and see what you need for basic, essential survival. Now, part of the problem for natural disasters is that there's no real plan out there, even amongst emergency preparedness. And um, Katrina was a good example. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody was prepared. It was all last minute, and babies were born in the Astrodome. Babies and mothers were separated. There were so many bad things that happened, purely because nobody had prepared ahead. It's one of the reasons I really enjoyed the derecho, and I think we should do voluntary, like power grid outage, for about a week every season. Because what you need in the summer is different than what you need in the winter, right? So we need to be thinking ahead and be ready for these things happening. Be big or small, like she said. So, okay, so I talked about that. Obstacles, no gas a lot of contamination. People who don't know much about birth are not gonna be able to get to where they're going. They're not gonna be able to fulfill the plan that they had, and they're not gonna have the information that they need to take care of themselves. So Ruth began to look around to see what was available. And the organization, which is the White Ribbon Alliance, and there's a lot of words on here, um, we have looked at this situation, but here's the problem. Everybody uses hospital medicalized birth as the understanding of how to help everybody. And that's not available. And I can tell you from practicing a long way from a hospital, taking the medical model into the home or into the wild has catastrophic output, outcomes. If you take the medical model, that's part of the problem with some of the medical training we have. If all you've ever seen is hospital birth, and that's your understanding, and you take it to somebody's home, you now have potential for increasing the risk by interfering with normal physiology and managing it rather than supporting it. And I, you guys, I can send you this PowerPoint. It's not part of the flash drive you'll get, but I can send it to you. So there's a comprehensive plan for states, Lots of educational material to prepare. And so most of these kinds of programs are really um, kind of based on the fact or an understanding that you already are ready for it, that you already have supplies, that you already have a way to make this happen. And that's not reality. Okay. The March of Dimes put together a comprehensive plan. 
which is the plan to provide medical personnel for deliveries in alternative locations. And we just talked about those medical personnel are over in the hospital taking care of the pandemic, or maybe taking care of the injured, or maybe they can't get to you because the roads are blocked. So thinking that you're gonna be able to get to supplies and resources, thinking that medical personnel are gonna be able to get to everybody, really isn't thinking about what it's like to truly be in a disaster area. So again, they expect people to have birth kits ahead of time. They expect for trained healthcare personnel to be available and that they will be able to go to the hospital. We're talking about when you can't get there from here. Okay? And your understanding of birth has to be completely different. And your first understanding has to be that you'll do whatever you can do, but not everybody's going to make it. And we have to accept that. There's no such thing as a 0% infant mortality rate anywhere in the world. And we have to be ready for that. There will be things that you won't be able to deal with. And you're just going to have to do the best you can. That's where the counseling comes in. ACNM also has put out some information and in using the term in place birth. Again, a lot of that information, and they have some new stuff that we'll talk about in a minute. When we put this together, the new stuff wasn't available. But when they talked about it, they were really, a lot of the information came about for people who accidentally had a home birth, but they were planning to go to the hospital or had access to resources and the plan was then to get transported into the hospital. It really wasn't about what to do when you didn't have anything and you weren't ready. Okay? Now, and Andrea is part of that and just gave me some information, which really is beginning to look at how to prepare for disasters. Although it seems to me it's a little more about, um, I was just looking through it, about putting teams together and going into disaster areas with your stuff. And that's great, and we need to be ready for that, but I'm also talking about unexpected things that happen when it's not, hey, I'm gonna call you up and we're all gonna go to the Philippines. It's, oh crap, I can't go anywhere, and my next door neighbor is in labor, which is a little different scenario. Okay. So a lot of these handouts, um, and I, I saw the five gallon bucket list, is that they expect you to have a, number, a long list of supplies on hand. You know, rather than going down to your basement and going, what have I got here I can use? That's a little different approach. Ruth was in my house one time. She, she told me two things. She walked around my basement, and the first thing she said was, you people have perfected the art of good enough. Okay, I think that's a compliment. And the second thing she said was, when the world falls apart, you're going to be rich because we have so many things, my husband being a pack rat, that potentially, whenever something happens, we could go look around and go, okay, what can we use? And you begin to put things together because you now have to think outside the box of your normal environment. So while these things are valuable resources for some situations, they're very incomplete. Now, FEMA you would expect them to have it together, right? They're the people that deal with emergencies and disasters. And their best plan at this point is services that enable children and adults to maintain their usual level of independence. Basically, what they expect you to do is to put the late pregnancy women in with the people with special needs and disabilities. It's not exactly the same thing. And a lot of that reflects our misunderstanding of birth. I mean, a pregnant woman has special needs. A laboring woman has special needs. But it's not the same thing as the elderly. It's not the same thing as someone who's handicapped in their mobility. Okay? So they've just been lumped together with people who need, who have, sorry, I'm moving around a lot, with people who have special needs. Still. Moving around is good. No, don't hold still. Don't hold. I can't talk. I know. So, so again, you know, pregnant women have special needs, but not the same kind as the people that we 
categorize as yeah. special needs. Um, so, so what this says, what this is talking about, is that FEMA has a course on how to deal with animals in a disaster, how to deal with your neighborhood pets. They have nothing about how to deal with the pregnant and laboring women. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> as long as we have people that know what to do. Because after when we've done BDBS, okay, we've done a pre a pre quiz and a post test to, to mm -hmm. see what people understand. And the main points that we've had to get them to understand is don't get in the woman's way and restrict her movement. Don't take the baby away from her after it's That's what they would do. So we don't right. want them to have a class. No, we want them to adopt BDBS because we've got to figure it out for them. And that's sort of a long-term goal. Okay. Well, there's Ruth again. Is there a better solution? And why a new approach is needed. So you could take this slide and put it into our earlier outline of, you know, that presentation we're going to give the president and all the special people tonight of why do we need a new approach. The first one is medical personnel are not trained in physiologic work. It's just true. I teach in medical school. I've attended obstetricians in home birth. I'll tell you a quick story. I attended an obstetrician for her first delivery a couple of years ago. And, you know, we had to kind of alter things for her. Like, we couldn't let her listen to the heart tones when we listened to them. We had to wear headphones so that she stayed in her mommy brain and out of her doctor brain, right? So at 24 hours postpartum, I went to see her. She had a lovely birth, by the way. I caught her own baby. It works. And... I knew her head was spinning from the experience, right? So I said to her, so tell me the first thing that comes up for you after this experience. She said, well, nobody told me that second stage contractions space farther apart. Mm -hmm. They just told us the uterus is getting tired up the pit. Mm -hmm. And then my head was spinning because I began to understand that medical um, training in birth is sorely lacking in understanding normal physiology. Like I said, I I've taught at a medical school, and mostly what I teach is osteopathic manipulation, but that gave me the opportunity to pull the students and you know, talk to them about birth and talk to them about physiology. And when they got to their OB training, they, they complained. They complained to the curriculum committee. And they came to me afterwards and they said, Dr. Bennett, nobody taught us what you taught us in the hallway. Nobody is talking to us about normal physiology and how to support it. They only teach us how to manage it. So we don't have enough medical personnel who know what to do when they don't have any machines that go beat. Do you guys ever saw the Monty Python? I don't understand that line. And, unfortunately, there aren't enough home birth midwives. Like, when I was in West Virginia, I drove two or three hours to go to home births because I was the only one around. So it's not like we have one in every community. And that's part of why I've gotten involved in schools, because I want a midwife in every community, maybe two or three. Can I just say something? Am I in the camera? I just want to make sure I'm not in the shot. No. Okay, good. Sorry. No problem. The sound equipment wasn't working, so I'm getting close so I can get sound. And... Yeah, just tell me what to do. <laughs> um, current training for emergency out of hospital birth addresses only the delivery of the baby with expectation to then transport to the hospital. So that's a different scenario than what we're talking about. And providers need to know not just about the birth, but how to take care of women in those last days of pregnancy, how to get ready for this impending event, right? Not just what to do when the baby's coming out. I'll let her lay down, put the hip, towel in her, her hips, cut the cord, take the baby over there. And shoelace. that's the training. Use the shoelace. Use a shoelace, yeah. Cut that cord immediately. 
And it's funny how I've taught a lot of EMTs, and that's one of the main questions. What do we do with the cord? Nothing. You know, just leave it alone for a bit. Um, so there really is a lack of understanding in the people that most of our community women are going to turn to to help them in the event of an unexpected birth. I taught a group of police officers once, just like a crash course. They actually want, had a lot of questions about water birth. Uh -huh. But one of them actually raised their hands and said, well, after the baby's born and you cut the cord, you just shove the cord back in so it can be used again for the next baby, right? Yeah. And, I, and so I got out and I drew pictures and yeah, I was shocked. Huge lack of understanding amongst the personnel that people are going to turn to. We've lost that. We've lost that knowledge. And that knowledge is being lost more and more every day. So we need to draw in different people to provide this, this rarely needed but critical support. Okay? So this training ultimately could prevent death. It could prevent bad outcomes just by teaching people what not to do in the event of a normal delivery. Okay? And it could be widely promoted at, just like CPR. Ruth, when she came up with this, she said, if we can teach the average citizen how to do CPR on somebody whose heart isn't working, we should be able to teach them what to do when a baby's coming out. If we can teach them to pull one of those little AED things off the wall at the mall and zap your heart back into rhythm, we should be able to teach them how to catch a baby. It's as simple as that. But yet our birth culture in America especially is so fearful that when you begin to talk to people about it, they just glaze over because they think that it needs to be left up to the experts. So it's a really insidious way to change that. So what she's created within BDBS is a very short course. It usually takes three hours, more or less. It can be widely promoted. It trains lay people. Like I said, a woman in every church. It'd be great to have that and how to avoid harmful activities. Um, we really, and I was part of this process, we really tried to think hard on what to call it. And originally, and it was right about the time Best came into being, she tried to come up with a Best analogy. And I was like, oh, we took our analogy, or our acronym. But it all worked out because we needed to put the word disaster into it. And it's not that the birth is a disaster, it's that the birth is happening in a disaster scenario. It includes um, information about everything from late pregnancy, basic stages of labor, what to do to uh, support all the different stages of labor, all the way through to infant care and breastfeeding. Because in a disaster, Women are going to have to breastfeed, right? There might not be clean water. There might not be any stores with formula. Women have to breastfeed. And these may be women who weren't prepared to do so. So if they weren't prepared to do it, and the only people that are around them are people that are formula fed and don't know anything about breastfeeding, you potentially can cause great harm with that kind of an intervention. So this teaches them also kind of how not to make breastfeeding more difficult. Does that make sense? You'll be safe with babies, normal babies. <laughs> Within the kit, which is what you're going to get, there's uh, that pre and post test so that you can assess your class and whether people got it. There's a detailed outline, and when I give it to you, I'll basically go through the outline as Ruth created it. Although when I do it to general groups, I, I kind of wing it. You might notice that about me. I wing a lot of things. And so I tend to tailor it or cater it to that specific group. There's um, instructions then on how you do it, a PowerPoint, and along with it, you'll get birth in the squatting position video. The reason we included that was because when you say to most people in America, because remember, you're not talking to midwives now. You're talking to people who don't know nothing about birth and babies and don't really want to. And when you say the word birth, what picture do they get in their head? In a hospital bed with all the stuff and all the right epidural, PCI, you know, like they get the wrong picture. 
So we use birth in the squatting position. I don't know how many of you guys have seen it. It's a really old video. Because it's baby after baby coming out with nobody doing anything. Okay? And so the first thing we did as a teaching technique is change the visuals and plant that in their heads of this is the way it's going to look. Not this way over here with the woman in the hospital or the ways that you see it on TV. And then the breast crawl video, are you familiar with that? It's a UNICEF one. I personally like um, delivery self-attachment better, if you've seen that one. And it's basically allowing the baby to crawl. It, it's it's um, kind of teaching people that newborns are born knowing what to do, right? Knowing how to get to the breast, knowing how to latch on, knowing how to survive. And I often say over and over again when I'm teaching it, if these things weren't true, there wouldn't be so many of us on the earth. And that is so like common sense that it opens a lot of doors in brains. Because they start to go, wow, you're right. How did we do it before we had obstetricians? How did we do it before we had hospitals? For me, the really cool thing when I'm giving this presentation, and, and, and it's usually been EMTs, small hospital personnel, we have a prison, um, uh, they call it a birth center, but nobody gives birth there. It's just a place where the federal prisoners that are pregnant can come and stay. They go to the local hospital, have their baby. They're about an hour or so from the hospital, and then they're able to stay with the baby for a period of time afterwards. So I did it for their staff, because here they were, an hour or more from the hospital, nobody knew what to do if the baby came out before you got to the hospital, or if something had happened. And they had like 20 pregnant women living there, or living there. So, so a lot of the times when I'm teaching this, it's to people that if I said the words home birth, like they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't come. Because to them that's such a foreign concept and so scary that they're not interested in that. I mean, most EMTs, they just want to get you to the hospital as fast as they can. I don't want that baby coming out in the ambulance. They want to get there, right? But when you set it up the right way, and you'll see this, and you talk about pandemics and you know emergencies and all that stuff that they really like, now you've got them, and they listen because they can now imagine it, and they can go, "Oh crap, what would I do?" The fun thing for me is that as you're teaching them physiology, they begin to say things like, "Well." Well, if that's the way it's supposed to be in nature, why does the hospital do it that way? And the answer is, that's beyond the scope of this course. Mm -hmm. But here are some books you can learn about. Or here are some resources that you can learn more on your own. So not only do you change their minds, you pique their curiosity. And then many of them go on and research more. And so slowly and insidiously, we can change the birth culture by helping people understand that birth is normal. Isn't that fun? You also get a one-page summary, a poster, you get all kinds of stuff in there. Certificate of attendance. We presented it, we presented it to a number of, um, and this is an old PowerPoint, but we've presented it to a number of yeah, that's that prison birth center I was telling you about, Homesteaders Conference. You'd be surprised. People want to know, young people in particular. Mm -hmm. Young lay people in particular want to know about this. Take it to your high school health class. I'm telling you, Girl Scout badge. Teach it in as many places as you can and adapt it to that audience. So in the first five that we did in West Virginia, 62 people total attended. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of towns. And these are the kinds of questions we asked. And, and some of this is a little off. But for example, um, uh, let's see. And, uh, and some of it came out wrong. Uh, what, what in particular? Women are strong enough to have a baby without drugs. Before? There were only 49 that said that was true, and afterwards we had 56. So we turned seven people around into believing that women really were capable of giving birth. Some of the other ones that I thought were really more important, 
Look at that difference. Women in labor should eat and drink what they want. Before the training, only 27 people thought that was okay. But by the time we were done, the majority of them realized that women needed to eat and drink during labor. Another really important one for me was that last one about it's critical for the mother and baby to stay together for the first several hours after birth. Now, for Phil, was interesting because the hire was not, uh, the question was, uh, should a woman stay in bed in labor? And it was 